quick side, I'm the uh, Vice President General Manager here at Kings Island for you that don't know me. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all here to the event today. Uh, I got good news, the weatherman says it's going to clear up later. So uh, the BCRT and the other activities for tonight, uh, hopefully we'll be on without any issues whatsoever. So uh, I'd like to give a hand out to our marketing department back there uh, for all their efforts. put a lot of time and effort in this. Hopefully uh, y'all enjoy it when it's all over. So uh, I have a couple quick questions. That I'm here to ask questions, which is a little different than normal. Uh, number one, how many of you have been over to Holiday Road and Road uh, Thunderbird yet? Good, bad, and different? Good. Good? I've had a few goods. Uh, how many people would say it's awesome? Is it better than Gatekeeper? Yes. 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 Right. <laughs> hmm. Whoa, okay, mixed reviews, that's what I wanted to hear. Thanks a lot. Hey, now I got one hmm. more question. And I'm gonna okay. I'm let everybody know what I'm doing the next two days. I was just telling Don, tomorrow I'm gonna go ride Gold Striker out to uh, Great America. Have many of you ridden that yet? I hear it's a great ride. Now, Monday I'm going to ride Voyage at uh, Knott's Ferry Farm. Has anybody seen that uh, advertised yet? Just opened on Friday. Uh, it's getting wonderful reviews. So I'm going to go ride those two rides the next two days. So that's the great part of having my job. I get to <laughs> country ride rides. So uh, today we've got a couple folks here to speak to, speak to you. Uh, the first gentleman I'm going to introduce uh, he has a little history here at the park. Uh, I think he was here about 44 years ago and the park opened 42, 43. So he was here before the park opened. Uh, he's based out of Cincinnati and uh, he's our own, as we refer to him, our own Dennis Spiegel. So Dennis, and a member of the Kings Island Hall of Fame. Oh, <laughs> so Dennis, come on up. I gotta put the mic down just a tad after Greg. Uh, well, it is really exciting to be here today. It's, 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 I can't believe it's been 44 years. Unbelievable uh, when you think about it. When we uh, started the planning and the process, probably about 46 years for for Kings Island. So uh, a lot of memories. I'm gonna take you back in time a little bit today to Coney Island where it all began for this park and its sister parks and then I'm going to pull you forward into Kings Island and uh, then at the end I'm going to show you some old uh, pictures we found in our archives so they're kind of fun and hopefully you'll get a kick out of them. One I know you're going to particularly like that we found and I had not seen my IT guy found this this week uh, when he was digging through boxes of old Coney Island memorabilia. So I'm going to save that little surprise for you. So a uh, little bit of background on me and my history here. Uh, I did start here, as Greg said, about 44 years ago. There were only 16 of us at Coney Island in management. Eight of us stayed at Coney Island, and we operated the park the last couple of years of its operation. The other team came up here and started the construction. And then... Um, we did the same thing when we started the sister park out of King's Dominion in Richmond, Virginia, which was the second big park. So, um, believe it or not, uh, I've been in the industry now 57 years. In fact, I was a ticket taker at uh, Coney Island. I guess you could say it was, uh, that's where that I caught the fever. We were just talking, uh, Don Helbig and Sarah and I, about you either love it or you don't. And I want to thank Don and Sarah and the team too well as Greg for inviting me and putting on Coaster Stock because this is really an exciting event and Greg I hope you trademark and copyright this so nobody else does it because this is something you can really build upon I know you know that uh, it's really been interesting through the years uh, to look back and, and, and look at the people uh, that we've met that have come through uh, this was one, Coney Island, 
was one of Walt Disney's favorite parks. Um, he visited the park many times during the planning process for Disney. I don't know if uh, a lot of you know that, but uh, he came often to see Ed Schott, who was the owner of the Schott family uh, at Coney Island. He'd go to Riverside, Coney Island, at Guam, Pontchartrain Beach. He'd look at him and get ideas. And when he got to Cincinnati, he loved Ed Schott so much, he offered him Disneyland to invest in it. He offered him 30% of Disneyland for $5 million. And he didn't have that kind of money at that time to invest, and he had to forego investing in Disneyland. You can imagine what that would be worth today. It would be worth billions and billions of dollars uh, had, he, had he invested. So uh, really kind of a, a fun story. That was a check that hung at the suite up here at Kings Island for years, and I think there's still a copy of it somewhere on the premise. Um, Coney, was a, Coney Island featured a beautiful mall. Uh, it started with well-manicured ginkgo trees. Uh, these trees were the hallmark of the mall. Uh, they were wonderfully shaped and then beautifully cared for by the park's landscaping department. And the mall featured a, a midway-like feeling, we called it back then, and I guess you still do today. And it was aligned on either side by, uh, by the different types of flat rides that uh, some are still in existence. And there are a few rides here at, Coney, at Kings Island that we actually moved from Coney Island. Overhead was a, a, a very picturesque uh, Von Roll sky rod with cars that were the first ones that ever lit up at night, creating a really colorful nighttime skyline in the park. Uh, we just thought that was really fabulous, and the guests loved it. Now, through the years, uh, the rides on the Coney Mall, they would uh, they change. On the east end of the mall, during the 50s at Coney, in the 60s and 70s, sat really two highly popular rides. One was the Lost River, and the other was the Wildcat roller coaster. And the Wildcat was really a fabulous coaster. It was a figure eight coaster. Um, the Wildcat was torn down in 1965 at Coney Island uh, to make way for some expansion that was going to be going on in the park. The Lost River, which you picture over on the side, that was an old tunnel of love ride, just kind of a pretzel boat ride that went through kind of the forerunner to the flume, if you will, and uh, uh, people who rode through it didn't see much scenery and there wasn't much because they were smooching and kissing and making out of here. So we used, to, we used to go in there and we did this a lot at Coney Island. We'd go in and hide and we'd jump out and scare the people. <laughs> and, uh, I'll tell you a few more stories about that because <laughs> that was one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> uh, uh, the, sh the shooting star was really, uh, uh, even by today's standards, it, it, it was a, a great, great coaster. Um, and uh, it had two basic ingredients. It had charm and it had thrill. It had a great hill and a great tunnel coming in at the end, which was really uh, very exciting. Uh, the shooting star, let's see. Yeah, there we go. The shooting star, um, it would, uh, at nights, when I was assistant manager at Coney Island the last two years, of that operation. At nighttime, I'd walk up the catwalk. You could get away with this stuff then. There was an OSHA and all of these other <laughs> that we have to deal with today. I'd walk up the catwalk, stand on the uh, top of the railing there and do the same thing. When people came up, they didn't expect to see anybody standing up there. And I'd holler, have a good ride, and they'd scream. And they'd go, <laughs> they didn't know what the heck was going on. Uh, that, was all, that was always fun. Uh, the Coney Island Mall, it offered a, a lot of entertaining features. Um, it had a huge penny arcade, those were big at that time. Caramel corn stand, age and weight guessing stands, uh, saltwater taffy made on the premise, some of the first uh, candy that was ever made in parks. Ice balls, uh, had a Ferris wheel ride monster, and I actually believe that's the same monster here that was at Coney Island. We moved it up to Scrambler. Um, had a wonderful ride, which I know a lot of you know, the old tumble bug ride, which lifted you out of the seat, which was a lot of fun, and maybe someday they'll really bring that back. And we had a shooting gallery down on the south side of the mall, which used uh, real guns. We shot 22s. Wow. <laughs> so you, you, uh, for a quarter, you got 10 shots, and you, you tried to shoot the target today, somebody turned around and shoot everybody in the park. <laughs> uh, uh, we have to use uh, 
<laughs> light. Uh, and we had the haunted house, uh, which was uh, was down on the mall. Over here on the right hand side, you can see kind of the peak peak roof. Uh, that that was a lot of fun. It was a pretzel twist and turn ride in there. That was another one where we had. Uh, little secret passages where we could go in and jump out and scare the people. <laughs> so we, we did a lot of that scary, and I was probably the greatest promoter, the promoter of that. Uh, during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the haunted house was a walkthrough, and it was a mirror maze, and that's what these, these types of activities were. We didn't have the animation yet and those kinds of things. And uh, it had many floors, it had confusing mirror walkways. It had uh, rotating barrels and curtains inside and things that blew on people. And the, one of the greatest features was, as you came through and you walked through this whole mirror maze, uh, the women and men, they'd, uh, they'd go upstairs and they'd walk across the front of the ride. And <laughs> when they got to the front of the ride, back then in the 50s, ladies had the big hoop skirts, poodle skirts kind of things. And as soon as they got to the, to the center of that, uh, the guy who was sitting in the sidelines, he had an air hose and he'd blow it and it scared him up over there. So people were always waiting to, down to see the reaction to the women and probably look up the skirt too. If I had to uh -huh. So uh, during, during certain times of the years, uh, the Coney Mall hosted uh, a lot of different events. We had the 4th of July celebrations, uh, special acts were brought in to Ballyhoo attendance and pump the gate during different times. Uh, these included trapeze acts. We had a guy named Suicide Simon that screwed a helmet on his head at night, put two sticks of dynamite in a box and blew himself up every night. And when you'd get him in the office to pay him and talk to him, he'd go, what? <laughs> he, he was absolutely stone deaf. <laughs> he did this for like 25 years. So. Uh, suicide Simon. Uh, the Coney area, the Coney Mall area, would hold a, a lot of people, the old Coney uh, in Cincinnati. We did a lot of elevated acts uh, that really worked well during that time. Many uh, acts played on the Coney Mall. Uh, it, was a, it was a place in Cincinnati where everybody wanted to be and come. It was very romantic, as I'll say several times. Uh, as the 70s came, uh, the park sought to, to bring in a, a new form of, uh, of entertainment. And, uh, a relationship was formed with a television company, which some of our, our older guests from the U.S. and I wanted to wel welcome the Great Britain and Mexican and other foreign people who are here. Uh, Don told me that we had people from all over the world, and I just think that's fantastic. So, thank you for coming over. Well, television, uh, the Crofts were very big in television. They had H.R. Puff and stuff, and a lot of different cartoons on Saturday morning. We formed a, a relationship with them, and we built the, uh, the theater you see here, Circus 70, and we opened that in 1970, and it was a huge success. Uh, it was actually the location that we were going to put a new attraction. Does anybody know what that attraction would have been? Ryan? The Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower. That's where <laughs> Ryan Wilcox from Lima, he's here, Tony Funk. Tyler Cook, three of my buds are here. They came in. They know a lot about the, the industry. The Eiffel Tower was originally going to go to Coney Island right there. And then we got moving on planning and designing. And, of course, you know where it is today, right over there. Come in. So uh, it, was a, it, was a great, uh, it was a great mall. It was beautifully featured. It had small fountains uh, on it, um, floral clocks. Uh, really, as I say, a very romantic experience. And uh, people loved it, and that nostalgia for Coney still endures today. Uh, it's been on the wane for, for a few years because it's been a long time since we closed it, but it's still a great, great spot. It still operates one of the greatest swimming pools in the world. Um, you know, our, our roller coasters, our rides, uh, our games, and our shows were fun. And I started working, as I said, as a ticket taker at the front gate at Coney Island. That's me. As you can see, I have more hair today. Uh, what was great about that, that was the first guest relations. Everybody had to come past me and tell me what they were doing, whether it was a CEO of a company or whatever. And I knew what was going on in the park all the time. And I would alert the different groups. So I, I kind of really enjoyed working there. I worked there through junior high, high school, 
and, and almost all the way through college. Um, and that's really where I started uh, and fell in love with the business and, and, and was a seasonal employee. And I know there are some people here who are uh, in the business and started out also as seasonal employees. Um, at the end of college, we were moving, we were dressing, we were moving, and they asked me to come in. I was, uh, the last two years, I said, assistant park manager uh, as we were planning the park. So I got to, got to put a lot of input into to, to Kings Island, the planning, and have a lot of fun operating and managing the park that I'd worked at for the previous 12 years. So, kind of fun. Um, what, what happened to us? As you know, uh, it's on the river, and uh, some of you may not know that, but uh, we would get a flood every year. It was incredibly uh, cumbersome to deal with. It was expensive. It was hard to clean up. This was the 1937 World's uh, Flood that came in, actually came into Cincinnati. It's the worst flood we've ever had. Um, second worst was then in 1964, and I was working there then. But that's one of the reasons we had to uh, move. Uh, the park had a long history. It was started back there in 1867. It was an apple orchard. Uh, Colonel Parker owned it, but it was landlocked. It had the river on the south side, uh, the road 52 east on the on the north side, California, the little community on the west side, and River Downs Racetrack, which is Belterra Racetrack today. That was over on the on the east side. So we only had 155 acres total. That's exactly the size of Disneyland. 155 acres. That's what Disneyland land was originally. When it started out, so we were we were landlocked. We had to do something, and um, in 1968, Taft Broadcasting, who had just bought Hanna Barbera Studios, wanted to uh, exploit the characters. Charlie Meacham, Bud Rogers, Dudley Taft went out to California. Walt Disney had just died a couple of years earlier. They met with Roy Disney, and Roy Disney said, "You know, it's funny you would come to us." when you want to get in the theme park business, when we wanted to get in the theme park business, we came to you in Cincinnati, to Coney Island. You've got the greatest little company in the United States, or why don't you go buy it? And that's what happened. The deal went through, within four months, the deal was done, and Tap Broadcasting bought Coney Island, the company I was with, and we merged, and we started planning Kings Island. So that's how fast that happened. You tried to do that today, if you could even do it, it'd take 10 years probably. So quite a quite a expanse. We came out here to Warren County. We were looking for property, and we found uh, the Kings Island site, and it was a wonderful site. It had a uh, uh, let me see. Just a second. There we were. That's that's our site. That's where Kings Island's located. We knew that it was within two and a half hours drive of Columbus, Dayton, Lexington, Louisville, Indianapolis, Middletown. So it was all right here. We had a tremendous ability to access people. We had phenomenal visibility, which is two of the major things you have to have. So we bought the property. We built Kings, we bought the property, we built Kings Island. Does anybody know what the original cost buying the property and building the park and opening the first year cost? Anybody know? How many? It was 34 and we had a little overrun, it was 37. <laughs> 37 million. I think the Banshee probably cost somewhere in the mid 20s <laughs> to, to build one roller coaster today. So, uh, what a bargain, what a spot, what a place, what a job we did. We brought it in on budget. It was really, uh, really phenomenal. So, um, we bought the land. Gary Walks and I walked this land when it was cornfield. We said, let's put the train ride over there and the racer back there. This is where the Eiffel Tower ought to go. We literally staked it out like that with a team of four or five of us. Um, Gary uh, was vice president of, of Kings Island. He was a young guy at that time, 20, 27, 28 years old. And that was his initial idea to do this. Uh, Fess Parker had just announced after his success with uh, Davy Crockett and with uh, Daniel Boone that he wanted to come into Boone County and build a park. And we knew that if he did that, Coney Island was done and we were we were done. So we accelerated the Kings Island planning, planning process with the board of directors. They bought into it and that's how we got started. And when the banks, local banks, heard that we were building 
Kings Island, they stopped Fess Parker, and we ran him out of town. So, uh, <laughs> on the other hand, he went out to California and built a great vineyard and winery. <laughs> and he, I don't know, he was probably happy the rest of his life drinking his wine. Uh, so, that, that, those are all stories. I don't know if you know those. Uh, it was a hub and spoke kind of concept that we, we conceived after Disney with Hanna Barbera Land, Coney Island, Rivertown, International Street was a pipe stem. And uh, it, it worked. We started laying out the park, figuring out what rides, what attractions, what we needed. And I'm going to tell you a couple of things in here in a minute. You probably don't know about coasters and games and things, but Kings Island almost didn't have any roller coasters or any games of any kind because that was sort of the. the uh, thought of mind of developers at that time. Um, they were, those days were bittersweet, really, because we were working hard to develop a, a bigger and a better uh, new park while wanting to maintain the integrity and the heritage of old Coney Island uh, that we built there for the 86 years. So um, we had to close the door on our decades of operation at Coney Island. We closed on uh, Labor Day of 1971. Um, we immediately started packing up and uh, we physically had to move up the road uh, 26 miles. So uh, we hired a local company to come in and work with us, uh, a company that was heavy rigging and had huge trucks. And uh, we had a very short period of time in which to move. Uh, we had about 45 days to pull this all together. Now think about that. I mean from knives and forks and cups and glasses to the flume ride and the sky ride and all the rides in the park. We actually achieved that in 30 days. So uh, we, were, we were very proud of that, that we got the, uh, the park moved in 30 days. We had everything up here lock, stock, and barrel by that end. Uh, it, was a, it was an amazing feat and as, as I look back on it. And uh, if we knew what we were doing, we probably wouldn't have done it. But uh, young and dumb, and we, 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 we did it, and, and, uh, and admirably so, I would say. Uh, you may know this, but uh, Kings Island had got its name from being located here in Kings Mills. And we took uh, the Kings from Kings Mills and the island from Coney Island, and we put them together. We had a big contest naming contest and we had some of the craziest names and stories you could ever imagine. One guy came into my office one day and said, we should call this Eat Zakata. And I go, and this is while Coney's opening. I was, I was in charge of the naming program. He said, said that's interesting. Eat, you couldn't make fun of anybody. He goes, Eat Zakata. He says, it's a land where giants live and all they do is eat rocks. Said, well, we'll put that in. <laughs> And there were there were a few more, a few more crazy ones that I can't tell you about. But uh, <laughs> there were some fun ones. And uh, so, actually, somebody did submit Kings Island. They did what we had chosen that name. So we we pulled their name out, and they were the winners of uh, of naming Kings Island. So to recreate the look uh, of of Coney Island Mall, we kept the. We kept the mall beds, uh, which are still down on Coney Mall. Uh, we even figured out ways to transplant the ginkgo trees, which, as I said earlier, were really fabulous and uh, very luxurious. And it was a it was a favored look of, of people who came to Coney. And we we put them on the mall. We only lost a couple of them. We didn't think we didn't know if we could transplant them. We only lost a couple, and they remained for quite a few years until they started dying off, as as, as which they do. That's what ginkgo. Do. So it was, it was, uh, it was wonderful to bring them up here, and it kind of brought that nostalgia for people. Uh, of course, the racer at KI. Uh, it was the first wooden roller coaster to be built since 1947. Uh, we worked with uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Toboggan, who was a great roller coaster uh, group of that era, and still are in Davis. And we worked with a guy named John Allen who was the engineer. We had known John for years, and he, uh, he worked with us. He was an older guy uh, uh, at that time. There were no computers. Uh, there, everything was, uh, was done on a slide roll, and that's the way John uh, developed this. Um, it was basically uh, uh, 
blue trains and red trains, just as it did today, and they were always weighted. We never knew which one was really going to win. It was by how heavy the train was loaded and uh, the conditions of the weather, etc. So I would imagine some of that still remains today. Um, it was in 1972, uh, uh, and uh, nobody had seen a major roller coaster built like this, so it was really exciting. People came from, uh, from all over. The interesting part, which I alluded to earlier, was at this point there were three Six Flights parks. There was St. Louis, Texas, and Georgia. Texas was the first, Georgia was second, St. Louis was the third, and they didn't have any roller coasters. It was beneath them, honestly, and because Disney didn't have any, this was the new era of theme parks, so they weren't putting in roller coasters. And um, uh, they, we had such enormous success and got such enormous press out of the racer. That was our big coaster at the time. That Six Likes guys came in to see us, and. Uh, when they came in to see us, uh, uh, it, it was it was just too much for them. So uh, they uh, Six Flags uh, started building the coasters in all of their parks after that, and uh, we actually uh, we actually helped them build the parks. Same thing for games. At that time, there were no games in the Disney parks, and games were thought of as low class uh, underneath the, uh, the the guest of that time and era, and uh, so. Uh, but we knew from Coney Island it was a huge money maker. It was the third largest money maker with the highest margin in the park of, of, of food and beverage and games was even higher, uh, but not as quite as high as revenue. So uh, we, uh, we opened with our games. Well, when they came in and they saw the games and the coasters, they immediately put games and coasters in every one of the Six Flags parks. So uh, Gary Locks was really the guy who uh, fought for the coasters and we put them in and we said now this has got to be a major part of the industry and that was the boom that started the coaster since then there have probably been over a thousand roller coasters built around the world and, and that number could be even greater so 40 years later uh, the Coney Mall at Kings Island still maintains that charm of the original Coney uh, things have changed of course uh, games uh, maybe not quite as popular today as they were back then, but still enjoyed and played by a lot of people who come to the parks. The economy had a little bit of an impact on that, as we saw. But, uh, and with Wii and Xbox and uh, all the things that Tyler plays every day, his, his games, people just are more familiar with those kinds of things. Uh, so uh, that kind of fell off a little bit. But uh, it's still, it's very much part of the, our industry and our business, and you see games and uh, certainly coasters everywhere we go. And uh, of course I'd be remiss if I didn't mention other unique features here at, uh, at, at the Great Kings Island Park. Uh, it's definitely had uh, a lot of first in the, in the industry and I already share with you how, uh, how we worked hard to include the, the mall and things like that but I think uh, it's also important to point out that uh, it was the first uh, theme park that was designed in-house company by the name of Randall Duell out of, out of uh, Los Angeles, California, worked on Disney, Six Flags, Opryland, all the parks back then. And we said, no, we can do it, and we think we can do it better, and we did. And we built Kings Island, Kings Dominion, Canada's Wonderland, we bought Carowinds down in Charlotte, and then took over the management of Great America out in uh, California. But we, we built, designed, planned ourselves, and did it all in-house. And, uh, and you can see what a wonderful uh, uh, outcome we've had. Um, the original themed areas uh, were International Street, HB, Land, Hanna-Barbera, Rivertown, Oktoberfest, and Old Coney. Uh, the Wild Animal Safari came a little later. Uh, the 331 foot uh, Eiffel Tower observation attraction um, immediately became and still remains the park's icon. Uh, the tower uh, was a vision of Gary Walks also, as I said, at Coney Island, where it was going to be put down by the Lost River. Uh, it was built in sections over in Austria. It was uh, constructed by the Intamin Company, designed by Intamin Company. And when we put the thing up, when we erected it, it was only about a quarter inch out of plumb. Think about that, 331 feet at the top, and it was about that far out of plumb. And that only just took a couple extra torques on the, on the bolts uh, to get it right. Um, 
we also uh, we decided to um, implement the pay one price admission. Does anybody remember what the first year admission was here at KI? It was six dollars, five dollars after four. <laughs> That's right, five ninety five. <laughs> and after four, we dropped the price, five ninety five. So, uh, and people thought we were crazy. The second year into our operation here. Uh, and we were starting to expand and do things. We had a, a meeting over in the admin building where Greg and, and uh, Don and, and, and all of them sit today. And we talked about raising the price and we said, well, we know one thing for sure. I swear to God, we know one thing for sure. We'll never break the $10 barrier. <laughs> Talk about visionaries. <laughs> swear we said that. So. Uh, with everything else uh, uh, ready, we were uh, we were preparing to have our grand opening. It, we opened on May 27, 1972. Uh, I distinctly remember a phone call we had, which I want to share with you. Again, it was from our young general manager friends down at Six Flags. Uh, two names some of you'll know: Larry Cochran, who was former president of Six Flags, and Errol McCoy, also one of the the guys who started the the company. And they were young and cocky, just like we were, only they were a little cockier and we were a little younger at the time. And I had my first speaker from the conversation. And we're in the office and we put them on and they said, hey, you boy, and they, talk, they had those uh, southern accents. What are you guys going to do this first year in attendance? And we said, well, our feasibility study says two million. They laughed for two minutes. <laughs> and Gary Watts, Ed McHale, Phil Dempsey, myself, we're all sitting there and we're kind of looking at each other like Ooh, you know that's kind of strange so uh, uh, <laughs> at the end of that call uh, we hung up we, uh, we started operating the park and I got to tell you um, there was no other park outside of Disney who had, who had ever done that that kind of uh, operation um, at the end of the season when we closed in the beginning, our average attendance here was about 5,000 a day. That was not a lot more than we were uh, than we were doing at Coney Island. We were doing about the same thing, bigger on the on the holidays and weekends. So we were a little little worried, and we kind of we kind of uh, uh, were biting our fingernails a little bit. And uh, I got to tell you that on uh, the Fourth of July, 1972. The floodgates broke open. We did 40,000 people. Every day after that, we averaged between 25 and 40,000 people a day. It was unbelievable. It was phenomenal. And uh, it, it, it was really just a, a, a fabulous uh, thing. There was, <laughs> look at our first Fred Flintstone here. <laughs> Isn't he handsome? <laughs> and the crazy thing is, Bill and Joe loved it. <laughs> Bill, Bill and Joe Berger, they thought it was great. We, uh, we released over 2,000 balloons that day. Uh, we had fighter jets coming over. We had, uh, uh, we had the parades. We had Miss America, Miss Ohio, Miss Junior, uh, Miss. Uh, we featured clown bands, parades. Here are some of the parades on International Street from that opening parade. We had skydivers. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was really, it was really quite a day. It was a lot of fun. But we only had about 5,500 people that day. So we were, uh, we were kind of surprised. So um, that's when we, we were a little scared. But as I said, 4th of July, it opened up. And it was, uh, it was, it was, it was really fabulous. Um, anybody remember the name of that first coaster? Scooby <laughs> Doo. <laughs> yeah. That's when we were heavily Hanna-Barbera closed. That's had a few names since then. Um, here was the parking lot at that opening. North and south was uh, backed up. Uh, un unbelievable. It was phenomenal. Uh, people who came really, they were just amazed. Uh, they were enthralled by the International Street. It was so gorgeous, that fountain, and still are at night with all the lights. Uh, there were 300 lights underwater all programmed uh, to the music and everything. So it was really, it was really fabulous. And, Word of mouth spread on Kings Island. I mean, truly like wildfire. We had we had a lot of commercials out there. 
at that time. But it was really the word of mouth that lit it up and everybody uh, sparked to come and see. Uh, so it was really it was really fun. We ended that season with two million twelve thousand. Of course, you know what we did. <laughs> Got on the speakerphone. <laughs> Called the boys down at Six Flags. <laughs> Cochran gets on. Cocky as hell. <laughs> McCoy gets on. What do you boys do this year? Two million twelve thousand. The proverbial pin. <laughs> Two minutes of silence. <laughs> it was the first park outside of a Disney park who had ever cracked two million. Six Flags had never cracked the two million. So we had done it and we were very proud. And, uh, and <laughs> our chest kind of swelled up a little bit then. Um, and you know, since that time, Kings Island has really just enjoyed so much success. And, uh, one of its major milestones, as you well know, in 1979, came with the building of the Beast roller coaster. Uh, what a phenomenal engineering feat uh, at that time. Most roller coasters were built on the bents, on, on wooden bents, and just follow, you know, a bent structure. We used that land, uh, and Charlie Den, Jeff Gramke, the team that was here at that time, I mean, really are to be applauded even today. In my estimation, still the greatest wooden coaster in the world. I get to ride them all everywhere I go. Don Helvig and I were talking a little bit earlier, and uh, we said, you know, with the Golden Ticket Awards and sometimes like this, things get lost because they're a little bit older. But I'll tell you, you think about it, the longest, the highest, the fastest. I mean, what is it, Don, about a mile and a quarter or, or half long? Four minute plus ride. Every thrill you could want. I'm going to tell you one quick story. I'm going to digress for just a just moment. Uh, it was the spring of that year. I was running King's Dominion down in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we came in for a board of directors meeting. We uh, we were setting up in our suite. We drank about a half a bottle of wild turkey. Before it wasn't open yet. Ride hadn't, hadn't started yet. They were running it with sandbags. We went down and said to the guys, Bill Price was general manager then. Uh, Gary Walks, myself, Tom Kempton, Mike Bartlett, all the GMs, we were here. We said, let's go down and light up the beast. So, spring evening, kind of like today, light rain, and we're half cropped. <laughs> we get in the ride, we take out. We're on the chain, we're all going down. We're down that first dip, we hit the whoop de doos we're around, we're through that little tone. We're up, we're on the second chain. We're going up the hill, and we're not quite as <laughs> as we were. <laughs> this is true, true story. So, we went down, we hit that tunnel, 560 degrees, and I'm telling you, we thought we were dead. <laughs> We'd never ridden it. Conditions were the fastest. There were no check brakes on this ride at that time. <laughs> We hit that tunnel, and you know what it's like today when you're in there. <laughs> yeah. Now, think about with about five shots of Jack and make a mark. Okay. We came out of the ride, we were sober. We got off. We went back up to the suite, and we said, what the hell did we do? We got to do something with that, and we actually met with the maintenance guys and slowed the ride down on the check brakes and took another two weeks to finish the ride off because we slowed it down going into that tunnel but okay, that was probably there might have been one more ride like that but I wasn't on it without the check brakes <laughs> so that, that, that was that ride uh, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it's still today you know just a, a major coaster uh, since the development of Kings Island, uh, there have been five owners, uh, Taft, uh, Kings Entertainment, American Financial, Paramount Studios, and today the, the Great Cedar Fair Entertainment Organization out of Sandusky. Uh, best said, Kings Island has always been, uh, from its opening, uh, just a fantastic park, a great money maker, a great uh, contributor to uh, fun in, the, in our whole industry. So it's been, it's been fabulous, and I'm really happy that I had to have Got to play a part of that. Um, we, uh, as you know, as I said, we built the other parks uh, later on. Kings Dominion, we 
built, uh, that was in uh, 1975, I opened that. Um, <laughs> that's me behind the governor of, uh, of Virginia at the opening of King's Dominion, standing there like this, with my hand on him, about to grab his belt, because I thought he was going to fall in the dolphin pond. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought he was going. And he was an older gentleman, and the most wonderful and stately gentleman. I kept saying, Governor, be careful. Be careful. I'm fine. He kept leaning over far from I'm saying, that dolphin, come a little closer there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we did King's Dominion. King's Dominion, I'll tell you one quick story about that. It's the first park in, and remains the only park in the United States that closed before it opened. On opening day of 1975, when I opened it, I was up on the Eiffel Tower. If any of you have been there, and I know Tony, you were recently, uh, it's on I-95. We had the traffic backed up on I-95, 10 miles to the north, 10 miles to the south. Route 1, which is east, 10 miles to the north, 10 miles to the south and Route 301 to the west, 10 miles, 10 miles. It was total structure. At 9 a.m. in the morning, I had 52,000 people already in the park with another 10,000 outside the gate, and we estimated 20 to 30,000 on the highway trying to get there. And it was almost catastrophic because we started to close the gates and the people started pushing on the gates. And we went out with our loudspeakers and we told them, we're going to let you in free. It's, it's going to be very crowded. You're not going to enjoy it, but come on in. And they did. They came in. And uh, so at 9 o'clock in the morning, I closed it. Our official opening wasn't supposed to be till 10 a.m. <laughs> so there, there's a little point of distinction there that I put in my resume. Uh, uh, let's see. After being with the company for a long time, I, I started uh, uh, International Theme Park Services. My company's worked on over 500 projects in 50 countries. I just returned from China uh, last Saturday, uh, heading back over uh, internationally. It's the, uh, it's the biggest boom time we've ever seen in the, in the history of our, our industry. There right now uh, are over 100 theme parks being actually planned and being ready to be constructed between Asia and the Middle East. It's just phenomenal. Not all of them will make it, but they are being planned. I saw one of the biggest projects last week I've ever seen in my life uh, over in Guangzhou, China, and uh, just unbelievable what's going on. So uh, really pretty crazy. Uh, we go to Russia, we go to, we go to the Middle East, we go to Asia, we go to South America, we've been to all of them. And uh, really, in my lifetime, I've been very lucky uh, to do what I'm doing, starting out what I started out as a ticket taker. I lived up in Amelia, Ohio, if anybody knows where that is, about 15 miles east of here. And uh, um, it looks the same as when I left 45 years ago. Not much changed up there. So pretty lucky from, uh, from my standpoint as a kid uh, to get to do what I what I did. The one thing I, I want to leave you with, I'm going to show you some pictures here and then if you got a couple of questions and answers, I'll take a couple. Uh, the one common denominator that I find among the whole world and all the people that we come in contact with, they look different, they sound different, the one common denominator I see among everybody is everybody wants to have fun. They all want to have fun. And think about it, when you do what I do, Kind of the Johnny Appleseed of the industry. You get to go around, you meet the greatest people in the world, you meet the highest level, the richest, all types of people, and you help them bring these legacies and fun into fruition and, and, uh, and really development and operation. So really been fanta uh, fantastic uh, from that standpoint. So I've been very lucky and I'm, I'm really happy and, uh, uh, as Don and I were talking and Sarah, you either love it or you hate it. I mean, you, you, you don't just tolerate it. So um, I wanted to show you, we found some slides going through the uh, prep for the speech in our archives in our basement. This is the old Coney Island office, uh, Don, Greg. This was down at uh, 4th and Main Street, downtown Cincinnati. We had an office downtown in the winter and then we went out to the park in the summer. Later that went over to 6 East 4th Street. And uh, uh, so there was an office down there until actually we opened Kings, uh, Kings Island. 
Here's the old Island Queen coming in. You can see the people at Coney Island coming up the path. That's how they came out. They get 12, 13,000 people on this boat bring them out to Coney Island, they spend the day, they dance all the way out, dance all the way back, eat, have fun, and they come into the park. There's the Coney Mall. Uh, that's probably uh, probably from the 30s uh, after, after the flood. Here's the swimming pool. Wow, look at that. Look at those bathing suits. Tell me they weren't sexy. Uh, <laughs> the swimming pool down Coney Island was built in 1927. Um, diatomaceous type of uh, filtration system. If you built that pool today, you'd build it the same way. I think it's the second largest pool. Look at those bathing beauties at the contest. <laughs> Simon Lease, for those of you who love here, he would have probably hollered at him. That was our sheriff. There's the uh, sand, sand at the end of the pool when we had it. There's some kitties having fun in the pool. These are the old cashiers at the park when everything was nickel strip uh, ticket. Here they were in 1969. And there they were in 1939, and I knew a lot of these ladies, and the majority of them are still in the, in the picture there. They were just young girls there. And when we found that, that 1939, I had to throw that in here. Uh, that's a little hard for you to see, but those are just some old ladies having fun, all dressed up, kind of the red hat club of uh, the era, I guess. Uh, land of Oz, that was our first children's land. We didn't have a Hanna-Barbera land or a Nickelodeons back then. You walk under the, the the elf, and he had a speaker in him, you kicked him and made a whoosh. <laughs> and that was a horse riding. We had horse rides at Coney Island. You could go around the track and ride a few times, and then it just became such a litigious situation, liability. We canceled it. The old Coney Mall, there's the sky ride with the, with the uh, Von Roll sky ride going over it. And that was really, a, that was a beautiful thing at night to see with those all lit up. There's one of the guys, uh, old guys, who I think is still here at Kings Island working on the horses. Coney Mall from, uh, from the 40s. That's Coney Island, that's Coney from the 20s. And if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, you see the old Noah's Ark kind of rocking one of the haunted houses. They still have one of those, I believe, up at Kennywood. I don't know if any more are left, but we had one here. Where? Kennywood. Kennywood has it. They still have it? Yes. Yeah. And that's fun. You walk in and the thing rocks and everything. The old flying scooters. The flying scooters that's here is the flying scooters that's at Coney Island. We moved that. There's a Wildcat, the roller coaster, the figure eight. That was our management team in 1968. That's me in the checkered shirt there with the hat sitting down forward. <laughs> down below there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these, these were some of those events we brought in for people to see. That was one of the first jet planes you could see, and we brought it in uh, and brought it onto the mall so people could see it, and they'd come out in droves. Taking down the Wildcat, getting ready for the uh, theater. Shooting Star, that was our entrance to it. You can see the lift over there. That's what I used to walk up and stand right up there on the top right. And our old carousel building, that was the forerunner to the carousel building here, and that is still the same carousel. And I think that's a 19, does anybody know, 28 maybe? What is it? 26. 26, yeah, 26. Philly. Dodge and rides. We still put the Dodge and rides in everywhere we go, everywhere in the world. Everybody loves them. It's still popular. I don't care where you are. You ask them what they want, they want a bumper car. That was the new Dodge and Whip and Cuddle Up building that we put in back in the uh, early 60s. There again is the old mall of Coney Island. Same. Now look down there in the front, you're starting to see some characters. I'm going to show you something here. See that little piggy? Okay. There was one of the first characters used in the parks. That was in the 40s. Look here. This is the slide. We found this in our archives, this actual photo. That is Mickey and Minnie. Mickey and Minnie in the 1940s before Disneyland had ever been thought about, a shovel put in the ground, that, as far as I can tell you, is the first Mickey and Minnie costume. I think I'm gonna sell that to Disney for about $5 million. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what's funny. 
when we get overseas in the international markets where they have no uh, regard for the IP intellectual property, that's about what Mindy and Mickey still look at. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one not too long ago, it was worse than that. <laughs> There's some more characters, look at them. <laughs> they, were funny. they walked around the park. That was the, uh, they used to have high diving acts off the tower down at Coney. The old Ferris wheel and the ice ball stand. The old ski ball prizes. People would come every night and just sit and play ski ball to get the tickets to win the prizes. Get a toaster and a bicycle, whatever they could. I was going to ask Greg if he's still here. Is three balls still a quarter? <laughs> I think that's about $480 now. <laughs> of course, remember, we'll never break that $10 barrier. <laughs> there you go, more of, the, more of the ride. There's a pretty shot of the Coney Mall. That's from the east end looking west up to the carousel building. So that's it. That's Coney Island. Coney to Kings Island. Uh, it's been a great ride, great transition, a wonderful park, a great legacy, wonderful part of my life. And uh, what I wanted to do is, uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take a couple. Uh, I know you want to get out there, but is, I don't know if that's rain or thunder. I can't tell. But anyway, does anybody have any questions? I, uh, there's a microphone that Kevin was going to circulate. Do we have it? I can't see with those lights, so. Uh, Hello? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, could you name some of the theme park companies that you've worked with over the years? Uh, just about everybody but Disney. Six Flags, Cedar Fair, uh, SeaWorld, uh, Parques Rionutos out of Spain, Merlin, um, uh, Reino Ventura, uh, Play Center out of Brazil, uh, some companies in China, I can't even say their name, uh, uh, Hanul out of the Middle East, uh, so we've really worked with just a lot of the companies, but most of the big ones, the reason not Disney, Disney pretty much does everything in-house, or they did, now they start to reach out a little bit more. Thank you. You're welcome. There's one, Ryan. Oh, there's one. Yes, I was just going to ask how far south was the original Coney Island? From here, 26 miles. If you if you get on 71 and go south, go to the river where the uh, bridge is, the the Big Mac Bridge we call it. If you're from here, and you go east six miles, it's right there, and it's still there, still operating. They have rides and they have uh, they have the swimming pool. They do a lot of picnics. They still do about 750,000 people a year. Not a question, but a comment. Mm -hmm. Too bad you should not, should not, uh, you should write a book. <laughs> the stories are phenomenal. Yeah. So we can all remember for history. You just want to hear the ones I'm leaving out. <laughs> you, you make me think of one, I'm going to tell it. I, I, I know you want to get out of here, but this is too funny not to tell you. Uh, every spring again, like we do, we, when it was just management, we're young guys, we're in our 20s, we're 23, 24 running these parks. And we would go down to the Dodgem ride, and of course you know the Dodgem is powered by electric. Well in the back, it used to be, I don't know if it still is, but there's a transformer. Well we operated for the public on three. We'd go down, turn it up to ten. <laughs> You get about six or seven of us in. Here it is if you're operating at a three. You get in, you know, push the button, turn the wheel, and you go like this. You, that's a three. You put it on a ten, you go. <laughs> and we would literally turn the cars over, and the last guy in the car was the winner. <laughs> and I had my butt knocked out on the floor, and you get graphite all over you. And <laughs> but uh, we weren't open. There was no public. It was just, it was just Ryan? All right. What was your favorite project that you've ever worked on? The favorite? Uh, gosh, we've had so many. We're doing a big one right now in Vietnam. It's about a $400 million project, and it has theme park, water park, uh, Epcot type center, city walk kind of thing. And it's just so wonderful to bring something new like that to a country that has nothing like that. 
and see them already reacting. So that, that's been a fabulous one. But I don't know, probably the, the big sweet spot in my heart is still King's Dominion. I took that all the way through construction in the first, I was there almost 10 years, five years of operation. So uh, we, a lot of what you see down there, probably a lot of it's gone. But that, that was you know me saying, put a tree there, and move a building, and let's put something right there. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, where are you? There. Is the one in Vietnam you referred to, is that the one where everybody said that all the Hard Rock uh, Park rides in South Carolina went to? It is one of them. We're working with that same company, which is a Sun Group. There's one in Da Nang, which is where part of them are going, and the one up in Heilong where we're putting that. So the Led Zeppelin is going up to us. And Ronnie Burney, who used to work with uh, Americana in Swordsville Lake, and some of you may know his name, Ronnie's over there right now doing the installation on those rides. And my team just got back on Sunday, I think, last Sunday. What is today? Sunday. A week ago today. Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> that Anybody else got anything? There? Gentleman right there in the center. Go. Yep. Why are these making the whole right side of the park um, squashed against the standard per se and they decided it's a whole area like Hannah Bob Badland and Riverdown? That's an excellent question and we made a mistake. <laughs> And I was telling Don Helbeck that earlier, he said, probably when you guys built King's Dominion, you did things 30% better. And I said, no, we actually did it wrong. And I'll tell you why. Here at King's Island, you've got the cut-throughs on each side. You go to hand the children's area over into, over into Oktoberfest and around the thing. At King's Dominion, we didn't have that. That was laid out actually about four months before I got there. And it was too late to change because we'd already cut the path. And what happened was it just created a pipe step where everybody flowed in in the morning, went back in the backside of the park, and they didn't come back up to International Street at King's Dominion until the evening. And 65% of my revenue didn't come in until after 6 p.m. at night. So if you look today, right before I left down there, the last thing I did, I put two rides kind of offset on the rides to kind of pull people back up there. But from a design standpoint, we missed it. The other thing was King's Dominion, here's the act. The whole park should have been this way, back in the woods where the roller coaster is, because it was really hard to compete up in, against Bush Gardens with all that wonderful shade. It took me 20 years to be able to say Bush Gardens is the most beautiful park in the United States. <laughs> in Williamsburg, it's just a phenomenal park. And couldn't say that when I was <laughs> Somebody else had one of my One more. What? Right here? Where are you? Oh, here. You're to your left? Yes. I'm retired. Can I carry your luggage? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. And I, I thought a couple years ago I want to retire and uh, kind of slow down. Hell, we're busier now than we were 15 years ago, really. It's true. I now have uh, over 9 million air miles from flying all these years and uh, with Delta I'm in their top three tenths of one percent <laughs> uh, get you because you got the mic somebody does I think and then I'll come back over here I hope this comes out right but I was wondering what was the choice of putting the Eiffel Tower here at Kings Island and the Eiffel Tower over at Kings Dominion yes and not at any other and not at Canada's Wonderland. Or at Carolina. Well, the first Eiffel Tower cost about a million and a half dollars. The next one was about five. And by the time we got to Canada to build that park, it was about 10 or 12 million. And it just got too expensive. So uh, when I was general manager of Kings Dominion, we put a mountain down in called the Lost World. And we took that design and we put that at the end of, of Canada's Wonderland and made that a bigger mountain with a waterfall. And we actually made it functional so it's the cooling tower for the park all the waters inside it now they they put a ride in it yeah yeah and uh, so that that was the reason it just got too expensive for the eiffel tower they they priced us out somebody was right in here yes sir i was wondering when 
you first opened the park in 1972. Did you have any vision of it getting bigger, like you're building multiple coasters, or did you just think it would stay as it is with one anchor coaster like the Racer? Well, Don, Don Helbig, who you all know, but one of the guys who put this together, he asked me that question earlier, and I said, hell no, we didn't think this place would ever be so We thought we'd die here. <laughs> I mean, really, we did. We thought we'll be here the rest of our lives. We had five owners, as you said. We knew it would expand and grow because we'd already, when we put Lion Country Safari down in King's Dominion, that was so successful uh, when we did it. And then we put it in here at the park uh, with the monorail here. We started down there with the drive, drive through, and then did the monorail, then we went back down there and put the monorail. And that just became too expensive to operate the animals. I mean, it's mind-boggling to think today that the Wildcat was torn down to, that you would tear down any coaster. Um, I mean, it's back in the 60s. And, you know, back then, they weren't building them. Nobody even thought about that. It was just kind of the evolution. Well, what was considered sinful? Like, well, the day, yeah. I mean, my God. I mean, yes. And there's a point. He's got it right there. there if you can pass it down. That and a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> With all your uh, experience in designing and building amusement parks. Have you discovered if there's an optimum size for a park? I mean, you, Kings Island here, has still got so much undeveloped land. Would it ever be feasible or, or it would it be, make some business sense to fill it with more rides and more areas? Uh, you know, they're all different. They all have their own personality. Paul, Paul's here with uh, Jack Rouse and Associate, works with Keith James. They're great designers of coasters. You do what we do, Keith's. Or do you say heading to Arabia today? So he's heading over there to build. And each one of them, Keith and, and Paul can tell you the same thing. Each one of them has its own cachet. It, it depends on the market, the culture, and what the support of it can be. There, there's one thing that we use today, and these guys use it, we use it, planners on the West Coast and Orlando use it. It's, it's rules of thumb. We try to give everybody 1.5 experiences per unit. That's called ECUs, entertainment capacity units. If you exceed that and you start giving people two and three, what happens? They go through your park too fast, they don't eat, they don't spend, they're in and they're out. The, shit, the, the stay is too short. If you give them 0 0.05 or one, what happens? They're standing in line, they're upset, they're waiting too long, they're not spending. So when we design a park, it's anchored properly. We, just like a mall, you put Lord and Taylor at one end and you put, uh, what's the one out in Kenwood, the big store, uh, fancy one, Nordstrom's, and you know, Macy's, and then you fill it in between and you balance it out so you never get out of flow with your park when you get your peak in park capacities. When we're, when we're planning a park and we're, it's on paper and we've designed it out, we take and what we call, we hang a camera almost over the center of the park, and we know all the capacities for that. We take a picture. Where are people in the bathrooms, on the benches, on the walkways? We allocate so much space for a walkway and a queue line. We allocate so much time on a ride, so many seats in a restaurant, so many people, cash registers, and that's called your instantaneous capacity. And you take that picture and you know exactly what your instantaneous capacity is, and that's your rule of thumb for figuring out how many people you can have at your peak end park. And you kind of work it that way. So it's very it's very scientific in that regard. We and it's getting more and more sophisticated. So Okay. There one more back there. And then we'll let you did you have one? Young man? No, you just stretch it. There you go. <laughs> I don't blame you. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much. I really enjoyed being here. Uh, if you, I'm going to be at the back if you want to have some more questions. Kevin, Chris, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Don, Greg, thank you. Sarah, for having us out here. Tyler, thank you. Tony, Ryan. <laughs> You're behind. All right, how about Dennis? A couple of notes for you, which is a reminder, dinner at 5.30 out in the Picnic Grove. We've remodeled it this year, so we'll be out there to get your feedback on how you like the new setup of the Picnic Grove. I know, how many of you wanted to know what was on the menu? Woo! Uh, you'll find out at 5.30 what's on the menu. <laughs>
just a little bit of a surprise. How many of you all know Sarah, right? Yeah. Sarah's getting married in August, and she just wanted me to let everybody know that she has registered at Macy's Bed Bath Beyond. No, but uh, no, we really appreciate everybody taking the time to spend your weekend here with us. Uh, for the different events that we've done over the years, you're part of our event history. This is the largest enthusiast event crowd we've ever had, 522. And as we look toward next year, we want to make it obviously always bigger and better. So as you see Sarah and I walking around, just uh, you know, give us your feedback over the next couple of days, and we look forward to seeing you out at the dinner. All right.